Invocation. You stand if that's your inclined. Father, thank you for um, opportunity to serve our community this evening. I ask that you be with us and uh, guide our decisions and our thoughts in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, we'll start off. Uh, are there any, is there anybody here that would like to have uh, some input on non-agenda items? Seeing none. Uh, I will, has everybody had an opportunity to read the minutes from our, our last meeting? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Mr. Chair, I would like to approve the minutes for the Planning Commission meeting of August 24th. And I will second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So now we have a public hearing. Uh, we are going to consider a legislative and quasi-judicial amendment application to adopt the North Redwood Development Concept Plan, update the comprehensive plan text, and modifications to multiple sections of the land development and planning ordinance in order to implement the NRDCP, um, I guess CPA 15-02 backslash TA 15-01. Um, the matter presently before the hearing body requires a public hearing. All interested par uh, persons in attendance shall be heard on the matter. If you wish to testify on this matter, please be prepared to step forward to the microphone at the appropriate time. State your name, mailing address, and interest in the matter. For those people other than the applicants, that are interested in testifying as either proponents or opponents, please sign in on the sheet or speak up when we call for testimony. For longer presentations, proponents and opponents may buy time from one another. In so doing, those either in favor or opposed may allocate their time to a spokesperson who will represent the entire group. You may be limited by time for your presentation. Generally, the applicant will have a total of 15 minutes to speak. The proponents will be given five minutes each, the opponents will be given five minutes each, and those thought to be neutral on the matter will be given five minutes each. The applicant will then have 10 minutes for a rebuttal. All questions must be directed through the chair. Any evidence to be considered must be submitted to the hearing body for public access and to become a part of the record. All test written testimony received both for and against prior to the hearing shall be summarized by staff and presented briefly to the hearing body during the staff report. Testimony and evidence must be directed toward the applicable review criteria contained as indicated in the staff report, the comprehensive plan or the applicable land use regulations which the person believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude an appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. Failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the local government to respond to the issue may preclude an action for damages in circuit court. Everyone present is encouraged to testify, even if it is only to concur with previous testimony. At this time, I would ask that any member of the hearing body who has con a conflict of interest to please indicate the nature and extent of the conflict and whether you intend to participate in or abstain from the hearing, uh, from hearing the present matter. Good. Oh, we're good there. Ex parte contact. Also, if any member of the hearing body has had any ex parte contact with anyone prior to this hearing, including a visit to the site, please declare the nature and extent of such contact at this time. I have visited the site and I've been to some of the public hearing meetings on this proposal. Okay. I've been to the meetings also, the original. As have I, the work session, the workshop. Okay. 
So apparently there has been ex parte contact. Uh, is there any member of the audience that has any question for any commissioner regarding uh, these ex parte contacts? Okay, hearing none, we'll move forward. Uh, the public, public hearing will be conducted as follows. First, we'll start with a staff report and then questions, if any, by the uh, hearing body. Uh, then we will open uh, the hearing to uh, public testimony. The applicant, not more than 15 minutes. Proponents, not more than five minutes each. Opponents, not more than five minutes each. Neutral, not more than five minutes each. And rebuttal by the applicant, not more than 10 minutes. Then we'll close the public testimony, and then we'll have questions. If we have any questions, we'll direct them to the appropriate people. And then we will have discussion and deliberation, and no additional testimony unless specifically allowed by the chair. A decision shall be made by the hearing body at the close of the hearing, or the matter will be continued to a date certain in the future. This will be the only notice of that date that you will receive. Does anyone have any questions about the procedure outlined for this hearing? Okay. Seeing none, we'll, we'll get started with the staff report. Uh, Chair, I think the commissioners all know uh, senior planner Matilda Diaz, and she's going to present the staff report. Okay, Matilda, yes. far away. All right, well, I hate to just regurgitate the staff report, but I'll hit the highlights that I think are important for, um, to call attention to. But before I even do that, I'd like to make a, a couple of statements about this project um, to the public, basically, because we had some misinformation that went out to the public, um, uh, just confusion in the newspaper, and it confused some of the public as to what the nature of this um, project is. So it is not an annexation um, requirement. It is not the city being involved in trying to develop anything. It is strictly a project that is trying to help the property owners come up with a development concept plan that is required by our code prior to someone applying to annex their property and to go out to the voters. So um, there was just a lot of confusion about that. Somehow it got turned around, and I just want the public to know that this is is strictly the city getting grant funds to help property owners to meet a code requirement that the city has for people that wish to annex their property. We do not require people to annex their property. They do not have to annex their property after this if it's adopted. It's just to help them meet the code requirement in the future if they do decide to apply for annexation into the city. So, Thank you for the explanation. Yeah. With, with that said, um, I kind of went through the back door on that. We did, um, there have been a little history for this is that there have been a lot of attempts in the past, over the past probably 10 years or more, uh, to come up with a, a concept plan for this area. And because this area is a large area, 66 acres, and numerous property owners, some challenges with uh, natural resources and the stream and, and it uh, abuts a collector. It has been very difficult for both city staff and private property owners to actually get it together. So we uh, fortunately, because it is close to 99, we were able to get some grant funds from a, a state program, PGM program, which is Oregon Department of Transportation and the Department of Land Conservation and Development in order to hire experts in the field to help us bring this forward. And so that's what we've done, and that's what this whole process started at back in, way back in November uh, 2014. Uh, so the entire process has been to figure out the concept plan, work with property owners and stakeholders to get this done. Our consultants are here this evening to sort of give you the overview after the staff report of that project and, and present the actual draft plan. My staff report is to basically just say if, if it actually meets our code requirements for a comprehensive plan amendment and, and a text amendment. So that's what I'll focus on. And, and the new um, language in the code that we are proposing in order to implement the plan if adopted. And there's no code being eliminated. We're just adding sections of the code to make sure that uh, that it's um, able to be implemented in the future. So that's kind of what it's about. So as I said, it's about 66 
acres um, split between low density, medium density, and high density with only about two acres of high density and um, 19 acres of, of uh, medium and about 46 acres of, of uh, low density. We aren't proposing any sort of zone changes with this. We're staying with the comprehensive plan um, zoning on that. So if it in the future ever annexes into the city, the way it stands now, it's going to be the zoning that we already have in our comprehensive plan. So that is not a change that we're proposing as a comp plan amendment. So it stays the same zoning. Um, consistency with our comprehensive plan basically uh, focuses on the environmental concerns element. Um, it, Willow Creek is, and the associated wetlands are going to be protected because they will be part of the city's park um, properties in the future. So the way we're addressing the environmental concerns of steep slopes and wetlands and, and the stream is that they'll be protected by the city. So that uh, outright protects that uh, element and meets our comprehensive plan goal. Uh, land use element uh, we're in our comprehensive plan says to guide and develop um, the development and use of land so that they are orderly, efficient, and aesthetically pleasing and suitably related to one another. The entire purpose of this uh, development concept plan is to identify the infrastructure, the provision of infrastructure storm for the public infrastructure. So it's stormwater, uh, sewer, parks, transportation so that we can provide uh, efficient and effective public uh, facilities and infrastructure for new development. In the past, that's sometimes a problem when there's acres of land to be annexed. Some people annex over here and then three years later annex over here and the roads never line up because we never have the big picture on how they need to be lining up to provide connectivity and to deal with stormwater in the most efficient way or to make sure that they're entering onto collector streets correctly. So the whole goal of this is to provide for orderly and efficient development of land. So it very clearly addresses that and incorporated into that is the transportation element which I just pointed out was that for circulation and to meet our code on collectors, on driveway spacing, and to provide a good quality of life for the people that would be future residents living in this area if it develops as a residential area. Uh, we want to make sure that it's walkable, it's safe for kids, and that things are lined up properly. Uh, so that has been uh, addressed as well. Citizen involvement's been a big part of this uh, project. We've had, um, in addition to our, our, our cadre of uh, consultants and city staff, we had a um, stakeholder advisory committee and a technical advisory committee. And the stakeholder advisory committee were made up primarily of property owners and representatives from, from major groups like the neighborhood associations and Campy Livability Coalition and um, Bike and Ped, uh, traffic safety. So we all had representation on a committee that provided input and oversight on the project. Plus we had a technical advisory committee that um, met and reviewed and that truly is what it sounds like. It's like um, people from engineering and the Department of Land Conservation and Development and the Division of uh, State Lands and a whole group of people that weighed in. The fire department was involved in this, uh, weighed in on their concerns to make sure that, that their concerns were addressed adequately in this plan. And we had several public meetings um, and we had some public workshop. Uh, and then we had stakeholder um, property owner interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, a, how many, did we, eight or ten, eight to ten individual property owners to get even more uh, input from property owners on their specific concerns that they might not be comfortable sharing in a bigger uh, venue. So there's been all along um, a pretty uh, significant uh, effort to get citizen input on this so that we address the major issues. So that we believe that, uh, staff believes that um, this plan is very consistent with our policies of our comprehensive plan. 
As far as a text amendment, it's a very similar criteria. It's um, one of the criteria is um, a public need for the change. Well, the public need here is that it's a requirement of our code to have a development concept plan in place for any area that's noted on our annexation development map. And this is one of those areas. So there is a public need for it in order to, for the, this area to be able to develop in the future. Um, so we feel like it has met that criteria as well. Uh, whether it serves the public need uh, better than any other change which might be expected to be made, I'm not quite sure. Um, it's a code requirement, so in order to implement it, you have to do the, the code amendment, so I don't know what any other uh, alternative to that would be. So by default, I think it uh, pretty much addresses that. Uh, will it preserve and protect the health, safety, and general welfare of the residents in the community? Definitely, it will serve the, the people living in this area and people adjacent to this area by providing safe streets and providing uh, areas that stormwater is managed uh, properly and they don't have flooding in the future and providing them some recreational areas. Um, I think it definitely uh, addresses that issue as well. When you deal with statewide planning goals, um, basically a repetition of what I just spoke. They have citizen involvement, which we've addressed, open space, scenic and historical areas, and natural resource protection. As I mentioned, all, most of that is being incorporated into a city park, so the city will then be the steward of that property and will take care of it. That also goes for goal eight, where you address the recreation needs of your community by extending a walking path through here and connecting uh, to an existing uh, park we have north of this and even further north, another park on, across territorial. We're building on the recreational um, opportunities in our community. So we believe that is met as well. Public facilities and services, we are, this is all about the public infrastructure and doing an effective and efficient provision of those services. And part of that is, once again, transportation, internal circulation and also how it connects to the existing grid in the community so it, it, it functions um, efficiently. So staff really does believe um, that the draft plan that you have before you addresses everything in our requirements for a comprehensive plan amendment and a text amendment. The text amendments, um, the code amendments that um, are attached to this staff report truly just implement the draft plan. We had to make a few um, uh, new provisions in our code. One of the provisions was uh, in our land use element of our comprehensive plan, um, just to make sure that we had a policy that addressed um, uh, the infrastructure for new annex areas. So policy number seven we're proposing to add to our comprehensive plan, which basically is can be, shall strive to ensure the efficient and effective provision of infrastructure to serve newly annexed areas. So all these areas in the future will now have it covered in our comp comprehensive plan that, that um, we will be able to address them through our comprehensive plan because we currently don't, we're sort of moot about that. And the implementing measure for that is the city of Canby's annexation development map shall be used to identify properties required to adopt a development concept plan or development agreement prior to annexation. That's in our code, but we wanted to make sure it was also covered in our comprehensive plan. So that takes care of, uh, of a comprehensive plan amendment. Now the text amendments weren't that many either, except the major one is that we were trying to figure out what would we do? Um, we have nothing that really talks about districts and how to actually um, codify districts. And so we created the North Redwood Plan District and we created a section for uh, a placeholder for future plan districts because we know we're going to have several more in the future. So this is the first one. So we'll add each district. If we get new concept plans and we have a plan district, we'll just add them to our code as we go and add the requirements of each district in our code. So we took the, um, the guidelines for, that are in the draft plan 
and just codified them under our district code. So everything that's required for development in the draft plan is now in the code so that it has a place in our code so anybody can walk in tomorrow that, that doesn't really, hasn't read the plan and they can say, oh, this is the requirements. If somebody comes in and wants to develop, here's what you have to do and here it is in our code. So we clarified that. In the past, we've adopted some plans and districts and we've never really had a placeholder for them. We just adopted them and they sort of live outside and we have found that that's sometimes problematic because I may know about it or the person that worked on it before might know about it, but there might be new people that come on board and they know nothing about it. And it's very difficult to go back and try to dig back through the plan and say, what in the world are we supposed to be applying? So that's why we opted to, to formalize it a little better, to make it easier for when people come in, we can answer them. Whoever's at the desk can answer their questions when they come in. So that's what the new district section is doing. Uh, we've made a um, couple of changes, additions to the uh, low density and to the medium density um, development standards. By and they're both. The, it's basically very similar. Um, the changes underlined in the low density. It says for land in the North Redwood Development Concept Plan area, the commission may allow public park land dedications to be included in the lot size averaging calculation in order to achieve community development goals and allow protection of natural resources. In this case, uh, the resulting average lot size shall not be less than 5,000 square feet. So what we wanted, the, the intent for that to try to tell you why that's there is we didn't want the lots to become really tiny, but we wanted the ability to say if somebody, some of these properties, if you've looked at the map, some of the properties have a lot of park and creek on them and some have nothing. So they can't develop that area. So maybe half of their lot is undevelopable because of constraints with wetlands, steep slopes, and the park dedication. So what we're saying, if, if let's say they have a, a lot and they could, if, if they had no restrictions, they could develop 10 houses. With the wetlands, the creek and all that, maybe they could not only develop five. What we're saying is that we will allow them to increase the number of houses on the remaining area so that they can recoup their investment in their property, but they still provide the the park and the wetlands are still protected and the steep slopes are still protected. Uh, but it allows them to not um, take such a hit on the value of their property, to be so honest. So smaller lot sizes. Smaller lot size, but no less than 5,000. So we thought we better put a limited because, you know, we don't want them to be super teeny tiny because it's a, a low density residential area. So um, the same thing we did uh, in the R1.5, but we made the same provision for that where they could transfer some of the development on their existing lot provided um, uh, they were going to be losing part of their property in a sense to parks and steep slopes and wetlands uh, but we allowed them to go to 4,000 square feet because because proportionately that's what you do. R1 lots are slightly bigger than our, than medium density so we proportionately made the lot size slightly slightly less to to make it proportional because normally they would be able to decrease it anyway so that's uh, the provisions we've done for that and then the last thing we did um, in case in the future there might be um, some plans future plans may in fact change zoning or propose a different type of zoning in a district, like we've had some plans, like the Northeast Canby Master Plan, that did propose some district changes. That has not been adopted yet, but we wanted to make sure that the district plan was the, the zoning that would go with the property. We're not proposing any zone changes for this North Redwood, but we wanted a provision in there in the future so that we would know how to deal with with a zone difference if it came in. So we just added that proposed zoning must be consistent uh, with the zoning identified in any adopted development concept plan. So that's more um, housekeeping to make it consistent that we're saying here's the plan we adopted so we need to defer to that plan for the zoning if there is any difference in zoning. In our plan tonight, there isn't any, but in future plans there might be. So we wanted to, to put that provision there 
uh, to accommodate any future plan districts that might have a difference in, in zone change. So, in a nutshell, that's basically all it is. <laughs> um, so, if you have additional questions, I really we would really want the consultants to be able to kind of summarize everything for everybody so that the audience can have a chance to sort of respond. Let's see if anybody has any questions for you. Okay. Not yet. The, the one question I have at the moment is is that you're shrinking the lot size. What is the lot size allowable at the moment? Seven. Seven. So we're going to take seven to, seven to five. In a normal, in, a, in our code now for like a low density, right. it's seven to ten. Ten thousand maximum, seven. Right. And so we're saying five thousand because five thousand isn't much different. There's not a huge difference between five and seven. Two thousand. <laughs> well, we looked at a lot of different ones, and we're trying to make it compatible. And it, and it's basically because but you're also doing that in the 1.5. We're in the 1.5. Coming down to 4,000, right? Right. We're we're allowing them to increase. They aren't increasing the overall density. You realize the lot would. There's no more people going to be on there than would be on there if they could develop their whole lot. So let's say that they had a 10-acre lot. And they developed it the, today the way they could develop it. We're not allowing for more density. We're just saying you can do the same amount of density, but on on the other half of your lot that's that's available to develop because you've lost this half of your lot to uh, the the park, the stream, the steep slopes, the wetlands. So there are some properties. There's not a lot of properties this applies to, but there are some properties that half of their lots are are kind of being taken up with with un, pretty much undevelopable property because it's either going to be a park or a wetland and they'd have to do a lot in order to ever be able to develop it. All we're saying is we're not going to give them more density. We're just saying you can take that density that you could do on that lot and put it on the side that's left. That's basically what we're doing. And that's so this will only apply to the lots along the Willow Creek and Marshall. Yes, the ones that are impacted. And there are there's a handful of them, a small handful. But they are pretty severely impacted. So that was just one way to deal with it without increasing density because we didn't want to go into the making it more dense. But at the same time, if they could develop it all, they would be able to have the same development rights on what, on their property uh, that they own. Okay. Any other questions for our defender? Any, any more from your consultants or staff that would like to step forward? Not proponents, but just staff. Go ahead. Well, I, I don't. You mean to do his presentation or to yep. just? Yeah, if, yeah, yeah, that would be fine. That, would that be okay? okay. You can just launch. Yep. Can All right. Theory? I'll just. Thank you, commissioners. <laughs> Uh, as Matilda said, I'm Ken Perry with Walker Macy. We're the prime lead consultants on this project, and uh, I'm the project manager for the effort. I wanted to introduce two teammates from other firms that are here with me that will also speak briefly. Matt Hasty from Angelo Planning Group and Andy Parks with Leland Consulting. So they'll have a brief part of this uh, brief presentation. We've just got a few slides we wanted to present to you to summarize the project uh, for your sake and for the public's sake. Uh, I just wanted to also say r right up front that uh, we've really enjoyed working with the community and with your staff, in particular Matilda and Brian. Uh, they've been very supportive, very helpful throughout the process. So the success of this plan is a testament to their assistance. So uh, it's been a, a, a pretty efficient process to date. We've started uh, back in November 2014, uh, and, but it's taken up most of this year in earnest, and we find ourselves here in the culmination of uh, several steps. Uh, this has included, as Matilda said, uh, some good public outreach. We've had really good turnout. Uh, for the uh, public events. We had a, a very um, engaged and um, interested steering committee, a stakeholder advisory committee, sorry, uh, which included uh, property owners and interested um, local citizens. The, the TAC was also uh, very useful. Um, and we've created a, a draft development concept plan, which was then refined into a recommended development concept plan, which you have in front of you. 
So as Matilda mentioned, uh, this is a 66-acre parcel in the, on the northeast edge of, of Canby. It's next to some really interesting um, natural amenities, fairly close to the, the Willamette River with Willow Creek uh, as a drainage through the, the, the parcel. Uh, it's got proximity to 99 for access um, in both north and south. Uh, at proximity to the, the Fred Meyer Shopping Center, and also proximity to the Logging Road Trail, which is a, a significant um, natural or local, regional, and, and recreational amenity. There are 18 owners of uh, 23 tax lots on those 66 acres. Uh, and you can see from the to topographic map here um, how uh, several of those parcels extend across the entire study area uh, to straddle Willow Creek which you can see from the, the steep topography on the eastern edge of the, the parcel. So that we developed criteria for that would guide our concept plan, and I've bolded some of the key terms um, in, the, in these criteria. And we, we want, wanted these criteria up front to have a way of measuring the work that we were doing uh, and ensuring that it was ad adhering to some shared values uh, that were, were also rooted in some of your values as a community. We didn't base these on anything but um, criteria that, that made sense for it can be. Um, so for example, integrating the project with the existing city of fabric, uh, making a walkable and cohesive neighborhood, understanding that this should be equitable for all the uh, individual parcel owners, and that costs should be reasonable um, for the variety of um, landowners. So Matilda mentioned that the Willow Creek uh, natural area is its a combination of a lot of uh, tough challenges for property owners. Uh, in the north end, you've got the, the FEMA floodplain, which uh, takes up about 1.3 acres. Um, and you've also got uh, potential wetlands. I say potential because um, there isn't a current uh, delineation, but you would need to prepare a delineation as a landowner um, to understand uh, what, the, what the extents of the wetlands are. Es essentially, the wetlands, um, and we had a natural resource consultant who went out there and sort of gave his best um, estimate without doing a delineation. The wetlands are associated with Willow Creek, with that riparian area at the bottom of the canyon. Um, related to that, there are steep slopes uh, that are, um, we would categorize over 25% slopes as pretty tough to develop. In fact, you could probably make an argument for over 15%. Uh, but we were pretty conservative with that number. And then there's just the areas in between, from the steep, between the steep slopes and the wetlands and the creek area, you, you, there's just areas that are really hard to access. So the, the, in our opinion, the city's uh, being very generous in allowing this land to be uh, dedicated as common open space um, for the requirements in your code to dedicate open space. So that's a benefit for property owners. Uh, Matilda mentioned the zoning uh, in the parcel. Um, this map sort of delineates the, 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 the largest chunk is low density residential at 45 acres. And then there's a layer of medium density and then a, a sliver of high density on one parcel at the southern end. So this is our recommended concept uh, for the property. Uh, this concept uh, responds to the topography on the site and uh, dedicates that open space uh, along Willow Creek. But it's worth pointing out that um, f for this, this is a concept that we've uh, developed based on our experience as land planners uh, and a number, any number of um, private and public-private developments. So it's, it's providing buildable lots, it's providing connectivity. We understand that each individual property owner is going to hire their own planners and engineers to come up with individual plans. So the important thing about this plan is that it's flexible and that um, there are, are just a number of criteria or uh, guiding conditions uh, that Matilda mentioned that are in the plan district and that Matt will talk about as well uh, that will allow the city to, when they receive the, the plans prepared by individual property owners to judge uh, how it fits with this overall concept. But again, there is uh, a lot of flexibility. 
So in the plan, there's in this plan, there's uh, about 15 acres of roadways, which is about 22 percent of the total, which is in line with uh, uh, development practices for larger master plan communities. Similarly, there's the, the nine nine acres of park. Um, that we've got an acre of developed park, which I'll talk about shortly, um, at the top of the slope next to the natural area. And then we've uh, just sort of got a, a distribution of low, medium, and high density uh, development that uh, relates to the same proportions uh, of the existing zoning. The total adds up to 65.31. You may be wondering where did the where's the leftovers that add up to 66? Well, the city's going to require a 20 foot dedication to make North Redwood a collector. So some details about the plan. Uh, I mentioned Willow Creek has steep slopes. That's that's a pretty uh, difficult uh, canyon to bridge. We studied uh, bridging it with a road and found that that would be really prohibitively expensive for any one property owner or any, any collection of property owners. So we are not proposing a bridge. So to, for these property owners to get access to the eastern edge of their lots, there's really no other way for them to get that access unless there is a uh, street, a cul-de-sac that's extended off of North Teakwood Street. This again would serve a small uh, amount of development area. We estimate uh, about 15 lots. These would be large lots, as big if not bigger than the lots adjacent in uh, Willow Creek Estates. Uh, there would be a potential for uh, an emergency only access across the railroad line, but I wanted to stress that that requires a negotiation with the railroad and ODOT, and those are challenging at best. So, um, but if that doesn't happen, if that's not successful, then um, Matilda's uh, been talking to the fire department and they'll accept that cul-de-sac uh, whether there's uh, emergency access or not. And that's a photo showing that emergency access. Railroads and ODOT don't like those sort of leftover uh, informal access points because, as you know, the train's barreling through and there's not a signal on that. It's not a, it's not a formal crossing. In place of a vehicular bridge, we have a pedestrian bridge because we think it's still important to provide some connectivity between those two parts of the neighborhood. So this plan, according to the current zoning, it provides housing choices, which is, relates back to your original intent in setting this out in the comp plan. Uh, majority of lots will, will be large lots. Um, using the ranges of density, uh, large lots are between four and six dwelling units per acre. So you'll get anywhere from 103 to 155 large lots, which are between seven and 10,000 square feet. Uh, and that, according to our uh, consultants, Leland Consulting Group, that's right in line with where the market is um, for this kind of housing type uh, for the region. Um, and similarly, medium lots, um, the, you would have a range that you could have anywhere from 84 to 108 medium units. And then we didn't, there isn't a range for the uh, high density residential. That could be a, a variety of um, home types, townhouses, small apartments, um, but most likely it'll be duplex or small lot development, similar to what's south of the, that parcel. And you would get approximately 26 units yield on that acreage. The, we're showing a variety of um, access uh, opportunities too. You could have alley loaded homes, um, or you could have front-loaded homes. It just depends on the builders. And we've tried to lay out our plan with flexibility to, for both those types. So I, I mentioned we have a lot of experience um, creating these land plans. So I wanted to sort of go back and forth between the concept and, and test, does this actually work if, if a developer comes along to um, um, lay out these lots? So this is a what, what I would call a demonstration plan. And uh, it just sort of tests the, the densities. Um, so one key thing to point out is that this is, this is my take, that we won't be prescribing any lot layouts. Uh, this is all up to private property uh, owners. But this is just one example of how it could lay out. Uh, so, so the total I came up with was 237, which is just about halfway between the ranges. So that, this to me mean, pr proves that it, it, it works according to this. 
So again, some highlights. We would want to include a pedestrian connection um, to access open space over to North Redwood. This sort of helps to break up larger blocks. But I would also point out that although there's flexibility for front loaded and, and alley loaded, you're going to have to have alley loaded along North Redwood because North Redwood's a collector and you don't want to have driveways and curb cuts onto a collector. Um, I'll mention that I'll talk about the park uh, later, but the, the bright green is showing um, this concept for a developed park, which would be um, an area with a, sort of a trailhead, maybe a play area, uh, a, a more usable space at the top of the slope um, that people could enjoy, um, and it's publicly accessible and it's publicly visible, as opposed to, say, a natural area that's wooded and maybe a little less e easy for. Um, people to use for families to get down to. And then this completes the, that, that testing of the concept plan. So in terms of transportation, um, this, we also had a transportation consultant on our team and that consultant actually created your TSB. And there is a, a change to the TSB that's going along with this plan, which is to remove um, what was the auto road overpass, which was not feasible, to cross 99 and the railroad and Willow Creek. Um, and it, it's not needed uh, for, for the success of this community either. So this is, an, this is showing an updated diagram, um, which is one of several that will go into your TSP. And we'll, we'll, sh we'll reflect that update. Uh, th this, this TSP is also reflecting um, several points of connection to the existing street grid across North Redwood, uh, which reflects our concept plan. Again, there'll be somewhat flex flexibility with those connections, but the key point is those connections have to happen at an intersection, um, an existing intersection for safety. Uh, we have uh, f followed your TSB standards uh, for streets. We're not creating any new street standards. Um, these uh, have been tested. They're safe. They're cost-effective streets. Um, one thing to point out that we would encourage is that um, although there is a range for planting strips, we would highly encourage for livability and um, for home values to encourage having planter strips with street trees to create the canopy over the street. So the, most of the streets will be neighborhood routes and the standard local street. So in terms of our layout, there is a hierarchy of, of street types. The collector, as I mentioned, on North Redwood, and then a neighborhood route which acts as a circulator and connects North Redwood in a loop and also provides access to that Willow Creek Park to provide that, uh, to, to allow other people, uh, other members of the public to uh, get to that park. As I mentioned, though, most of the streets are these local streets, which again will be flexible and um, uh, there will be some negotiation between the city and property owners when they create their, their own plans. The, the, the parks that I mentioned, uh, that developed park um, at, the, at the top of the slope, would have features similar to this a play area, maybe a picnic shelter, a trailhead. To, to access the trail. The trail, the, the specifics of the trail design will be figured out at a later stage by the city. So we haven't, we're not really committing to what, what kind of trail this is or the design. It's going to be about a half mile long and um, it, it provides some really good connectivity and access to Willow Creek. And it's also worth pointing out that the, you've got logging road trail. That's a different kind of trail. That's more of a city connection. It gets people to different destinations. This trail is more about the residents and giving them sort of a connection to nature. Can I interrupt you for just a second? Yep. Okay. Um, on Willow Creek, what is the slope from where the park is going to be down into Willow Creek? And uh, so that's just one, one question. The other question would be, Who's going to maintain the park? Who's responsible for maintaining the park and the pedestrian bridge? And then three, who is, what, if you're going to have kids playing in there, if the slope, slope is steep, what kind of safety features are you uh, going to be implementing to make sure that, you know, kids don't fall down the slope and, you know, fall into the creek? And, I, and the fourth, final thing is, is that uh, is is Willow Creek? Because I haven't 
you know, I'm not supposed to go there and look. Is that a year-round creek? Is that a free-flowing creek? Is it spring. got covered with underbrush? What's it? It's spring-fed, and okay. it's, it's year-round, but it's um, it's fish-bearing, but not doesn't have uh, some on it at the moment, so it doesn't have any fish that's protected by the Endangered Species Act, because we, we work with Fish and Wildlife on that to make sure of what's in there. Um, and also, we did originally do a, a delineation. I just want to, it's just outdated, but it, nothing much has changed. That's where all those, that's why we know a lot of the stuff is there, and we have to double check that. As far as the park plan and who's going to take care of it, we had this discussion with our administrator, and he said that is something that's a separate part of this, and that that's the, one of the goals of the city is to determine the future of park uh, maintenance and that the, he fully feels like we will have that figured out by the time any of, any of this comes in. So it will be a different, completely different process. It's like we do, uh, we have a lot of land now that's not developed as park land. And until we have a way to develop it, it's like land banking until we have that figured out. And we would have a plan process which would include all of the people in the area on the design of the proposed uh, amenities, which is mostly a walkway uh, and a trailhead, we would we would do a design process, which is what we do for pretty much every park that we do, which will include the neighbors. And at that time, we figure out how what is the vehicle that is going to be taking care of it, whether we go out for Wilderness International or whether we do a. a an agreement with the homeowners or whatever it's going to be that is figured out at the time when we design the actual park itself. So the park, the park, I think the park on the park, but <clears throat> so. Um, as far as steepness, I can't answer that. Do we know that? I'm sorry, it, I it, left it, off your question about The steepness that. varies, uh, the, the elevation drop varies. Uh, there, there are 25% and over slopes in there. There's some pretty steep, pretty steep areas. But I would point out, you know, there's, uh, we, we've got experience on uh, a few trails, for example, um, at Jackie Houston Park um, up in, in the North Bethany area. You, you can use uh, sort of gabion walls to help to protect the, at least the uphill slope from sliding. And you can use you know, railings and low fences too to help to provide guidance to people to, to stay off the steep slopes. Um, in that community you, park, the, the gabions? They just, the Wilderness International has been installing those as a way to approach our pond. So I, I guess sticking with the park for just a minute, how you're going to fund upkeep maintenance for that? Um, I don't. I don't think there's a whole bunch of money in the budget for maintaining parks nope. as is. So my concern, of course, is that. You know what? There is no guarantee for money in the future to maintain park. I mean, it, it's, it's, I'm just curious as to how. I mean, I love the concept, but I got to tell you, it's a big, it's a big issue citywide, right. and so it's a big issue that's being discussed and and an ongoing conversation. And there are many ways that that could be approached. They, the, the council and the administrator haven't brought anything forward yet, but there's a lot of options. We just haven't decided on uh, which ones to bring forward yet, but there's a lot of analysis and a lot of exploration on how we're going to resolve it. It has to be resolved because the city of Canby collects money for parks, so we can construct them, so we need to be able to figure out which mechanism, whether it's going to be a public-private partnership, whether it's going to be uh, an different SDC uh, reimbursement fees, whether it's going to be a park maintenance fee. They're all on the table. They're all being reviewed, and and it will be figured out because we have to figure them out on every single park here. So, And as part of the, the process for developing the concept for this particular piece of park, that will be put in place, the maintenance piece of that will be put in place when we do that plan. So we've had a lot of discussion about this, and there are several other parks that are under the same um, cloud, so to speak, of how we're going to move that forward. But there is, 
no doubt that we're going to move it forward. We just haven't quite figured out the best way to move it forward. It might be several different combinations of ways to finance them. We may be entering in public-private. We may be doing maintenance fees. We may be, I, you know, I, budgetary items. We may. I'm not sure. Maybe more volunteerism, which we are not sure what we're going to do. But it's there. May be more than one way to skin the cat. It's all on the table, and it's a high priority for us as a community to get figured out because it impacts every other development in Canby. And, and every other park. And every other yeah. park that's already out there uh, that we're waiting to, to see how we can maintain them. So I, I think it's a pretty high on the list of what's got to get figured out, and it's not really an option not to figure it out. We're going to have to figure it out. and. I can tell you it's it, there's a lot of work being done around that issue to get it the best solution that will work for Canby. And we're even working with the Park District on, on that issue. So okay. so I know that's a really long and crazy act. No, I, actually that's no exactly the answer. Wide answer yet, but I guarantee you it's in the hopper and it's being really, really worked on. Sorry to interrupt him. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> So just to pivot to uh, the utility uh, matters, we have another uh, team member, OTAC, who are civil engineers and have worked on a lot of uh, private development. So they studied the, how the concept plan uh, could uh, meet the provision of basic utilities uh, for the project. They found that uh, there is a 12-inch water line under Red Redwood. That's plenty of capacity to serve this new development. Uh, the one criteria they mentioned that they would uh, it, it need to see are at least two of these three connections that are shown on North Redwood um, would be needed to create a loop for water pressure purposes. Uh, but otherwise, water service is, is set. Sewer service similarly has capacity under North Redwood. Uh, the only area that might uh, have issues if the owners of this property were to maximize the developable area as, as shown and bring a cul-de-sac down into this uh, lower area, you would need a, a small pump station to get the waste up to an area where it could feed by gravity uh, to, North, to North Redwood. Um, but again, it's mainly gravity fed towards North Redwood. And then finally, stormwater, uh, you have uh, good public work standards uh, to treat stormwater before it, it reaches Willow Creek. Uh, there's five basins in the property that are, are reflective of the different uh, topography. Uh, and each one of those basins, or almost all those basins, four out of the five would have their own treatment facility, a, a low impact um, or LID facility. And these are a little hard to, to, to notice in the map, but for example, in this north basin, which is outlined here, that treatment facility would be uh, generally to the north of the, the parcel. Uh, for this small south basin down here, there'd be a little treatment area uh, that intercepts stormwater before it hits Willow Creek. Generally, they, these are at lower points, and they intercept the stormwater before they reach the creek. There is actually an area adjacent to North Redwood. Uh, we've studied the stormwater line that's under North Redwood, which serves the neighborhood to the west. And there's enough capacity that almost 12 acres of this study area can use the pipe under North Redwood uh, for stormwater. So just to go through back to the criteria that we had listed, uh, we wanted to, again, test those criteria, test how the plan meets those. And I won't r read through all of this text, but to suffice to say that we've, we're satisfied, uh, and we hope you would, would share in that, that the criteria on the left are, are met through this concept plan. Things like reasonable costs of infrastructure, um, uh, allowing emergency access, and connecting the community to natural areas. So now I'd like to invite the two team members, uh, Matt and Andy, to come up, and they'll talk about the specifics of funding and, and, and zoning. I had a quick question for Matilda before she runs off. Matilda? Matilda? Yep. Um, you said that you did, you were working with Parks District, too. Is that Camby Parks District? Or is it? Camby Area Parks District. They're, they're um, working to reduce the size of the district, and they're going before the um, 
Clackamas County Board of Commissioners to get that approved and then they're going to go back out and try to revamp the district. So we're working with them to see if we can work out some sort of arrangement as one possible solution for, for parking events. That's also on the table. So. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman and uh, Commissioners, and uh, nice to see you again, Brian. Yes, in a good while. to see you again, too. Yeah, I worked with Brian over in Westland for a few years, uh, several years ago. Uh, speaking of uh, infrastructure and how it's being paid for, there's local infrastructure and then non-local or area-wide type infrastructure that's involved with this particular project. And what you'll note is with the exception of parks, what was determined is all of the other infrastructure is appears to be uh, of the nature of local, which means that they would be the responsibility of the property owner, the developer, to ultimately put those in at the time that they develop. The one uh, infrastructure component that was determined to be of area-wide benefit and could argue maybe even go beyond the local area here would be the, the parks improvements. And the strategy that ultimately has been communicated, I think, through memo and, and other form is that this gets paid for through a combination of SDCs and land dedications. And you'll see that uh, there's the, the density bonus that was mentioned earlier. Uh, that provided and, and was a part of this reimbursement uh, type formula to ultimately help value the land that is ultimately being provided and dedicated back to the city. And then the value of that land plus whatever SDCs might be paid would ultimately generate for the, the city the funding mechanism to pay for this. The total amount that is uh, projected to be generated on your SDC, which is currently in the city of 5625, was a low of a million one, and that was with the 213 single family homes, to a million five with the 289 homes. So an average roughly of about a million three would be generated through this pro you know, through this process. And again, the, the the property owners that ultimately are contributing land that is, say, worth more than the SDCs that they would ultimately have to pay, they might be getting some SDCs reimbursed back to them when those SDCs become available. For those that are contributing land and it isn't quite up to what their SDCs would be charged, they would also be paying SDCs for the development of the property. Any questions with respect to the parks? Yeah, there is one. So the pedestrian bridge is going to be funded in the same manner? Yes, I believe that is all part of the park infrastructure cost. Is that correct? Um, well, yes and no. The, the reimbursement that you're talking about for the park is for the land dedication, not for the actual development of the park. The structure that we're talking about there is a way to reimburse um, the people that have most of the park on their property so the, the SDCs that come in from the people that don't have the park property, that will go to help reimburse the difference between the value of what they've dedicated and the value of the wetlands and it's all calculated and what they would be owing or, or for SDCs if they overpay or under, underpay. So the infrastructure for the, the actual park, we would construct after we did a master plan, we, we would have either a combination of grants or our, our big pot of SDCs that we collect throughout the city. Uh, and we would develop that in the future with those types of funds. So the, the, this structure that we're talking about here is primarily for the land acquisition piece of this. And to make people whole who have more park land dedicated on their property than the people to the west that have no parkland dedication. So the SDCs from the people that have no parkland would be used to reimburse the people who are giving more than their share of parkland. But your SDCs do pay for not just the land, but also improvements. The SDCs in the future 
but it would be a large pot, of, larger than this pot of SJCs in general will be used to develop this park with a combination of so, using grant funds. And so are you saying that SDCs from another development unrelated to this yeah, well, could we, go to help finance yes. the, and maintain the park here? What we do, not maintain. Not maintain. No, not just, maintain. Just, okay. just develop. Just SDCs, okay. we have an SDC pot from all over the city, and then we have a capital improvement plan where those SDCs can be spent. This goes on this. This will go on the capital improvement plan when it becomes part of the city, and we can allocate some SDCs to leverage grants to, to build this in the future. That's how they work all over town. So this pot of SDCs here, we worked out this formula to try to make people whole, as whole as possible for the, the disproportionate impacts of park dedication on some of the properties when the other people really just are going to be paying SDCs and not having to give up property. So it's a way to, uh, to creatively kind of reimburse people for having a disproportionate effect for land dedication on their property. But in general, the park, the development of the park gets paid for through SDCs, grants, and other yeah. sources. So and so maintenance the of the park is, is left to the future. Still, yeah, we don't have okay. reimbursement SDCs at this time. And and just to clarify, reimbursement SDCs couldn't be used for maintenance. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, reimbursement so SDC would be to pay for that infrastructure that somebody put in, okay. including the city. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. I'm going on my slideshow here. And <laughs> put that one. Thank you. So the other infrastructure, again, is streets, stormwater, local roads and sanitary sewer and those improvements would be primarily dealt with at the local level by the uh, property owner at the time of development uh, there is some uh, recommendations related to the potential use of reimbursement districts where uh, a developer gets in ahead of others and ultimately builds the infrastructure that's addressed within the concept documents uh, the uh, other thing that may happen in here is you, you try and adjust those property uh, or excuse me the, the infrastructure that's going on so that it is